Hello and welcome to Forbidden History Radio, where we explore humanity's hidden history, out-of-place artifacts, lost civilizations, and startling evidence that the truth is being suppressed. Well, today we're going to be talking about the uh, ancient technology of Peru. And to do that, we're going to be speaking with Brian Forrester and Christopher Dunn, um, both experts in different areas. Brian is an expert in Peruvian uh, structures and mythology and law, and Christopher is a machinist. But we're going to get a little more information from both of them here in a second. So let me introduce our guest today, and we're going to get started because we have a lot of material to cover. Uh, the study of the Inca culture led Brian Forrester to write a book, A Brief History of the Incas, and is also actively engaged in the native ship Shipio people from the central Amazon of Peru, promoting the sale of their traditional arts and crafts. In addition to his now four books, he has written articles for Graham Hancock. He is also associated with Lloyd Pye of the Star Child Product, who is analyzing the DNA of the elongated human skulls of the Peruvian Paracas culture on his behalf. Brian will be joining David Hatcher, Childress, and Hugh Newman uh, of Megalomythic, I cannot even say that word, on a tour of Peru and Bolivia, you know, and that's already come and gone. So I guess this bio is just a little bit old. So cancel that part, but I'm just going to throw this in. But Brian and Chris are going to be doing a tour of Peru in August, which we're going to talk a little bit about in the minute. Um, Christopher, on the other hand, has an extensive background as a master craftsman, starting as an apprentice at an engineering company in his hometown of Manchester, England. Recruited by an American aerospace company, he immigrated to the United States in 1969. Beginning as a skilled machinist and toolmaker, he has worked at almost every level of high-tech manufacturing from building to operating high-powered industrial lasers, including the position of project engineer and laser operations manager at Danville Metal Stamping, a Midwest aerospace manufacturer. He's now a senior manager at that company. So please welcome to Just Energy Radio, Brian Forrester and Christopher Dunn. Hey guys, how are you doing? Fine, thanks. I'm doing great. Thank you, Rita. Hey, thanks for coming on the show. I think this is going to be really interesting because we're going to get this kind of blend of, you know, social and cultural and historical along with technical, and I think it's just going to make for a very interesting conversation and dynamic. But to start, um, I want to start with you, Chris. Um, the work you've done in the past has really been, and the focus of your last two books, has been surrounding the construction of statuary and temples in Egypt. What's drawing your attention to looking at what's going on in Peru? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, my, uh, my studies have been mostly in Egypt. I've, I've traveled in Egypt nine times and done a lot of research there. Uh, I have, have two books, the, the Giza Power Plants and my last book, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt. But um, I first went to Peru and Bolivia in 2005 with uh, David Hatcher Childress. And what I was, what I normally do when I go to an ancient ancient sites is to look for, uh, look at the works that these ancient people did, and uh, to see, you know, essentially what what level of technology they may have been using. Uh, the uh, amount of difficulty in, in their in their craftsmanship and and essentially uh, if there are any what I consider to be signatures of uh, advanced uh, machining or advanced uh, methods of manufacture. The uh, I found it in Egypt. I mean, it's all over Egypt, and everybody, uh, most people recognize now that that the ancient Egyptians were highly advanced and there was a there <clears throat> there's information that was being discussed about Peru and Bolivia that seemed to indicate that they too were uh, also advanced but before I could comment on that I had to go there and uh, so in 2005 I went went through Peru went to all the major sites which we will be visiting in August 
And they did some amazing things. I mean, it is a huge mystery in Peru uh, and Bolivia. It, uh, the uh, level of te- technique that that uh, they used was surprising to me. And as, I, as we, I went through Peru, um, I, I couldn't really relate what they had done with how the Egyptians were cutting stone, cutting and moving large pieces of stone. Their, their uh, constructions are, are simply mind-blowing in a way, when, uh, particularly when you look at the amount and the amount of stone that they had cut very precisely and fitted together almost like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and it, it, you stand in front of these uh, massive walls with 100-ton pieces and you, you scratch the head, your, your head as far as, you know, how, how did they cut these so precisely? How did they even lift them and put them into position? All these questions uh, come to mind. But, but, but the, uh, the true precision that we find in Egypt, I, I, I wasn't uh, really finding that much in, in Peru. Uh, except for ultra flat surfaces, they did have some elements, particularly at Ayante Tambo, uh, where they have, uh, ultra flat surfaces. Also, you find it at the Coricancha in Cusco. So, uh, these, these sites, uh, had ultra flat surfaces. But and what I was thinking of doing is that we would kind of do like a little virtual tour, um, of some of the different sites. But before we do that, I understand that you guys are kind of working on doing a tour in South America, in Peru, and going to a number of these sites. Kind of, uh, do you want to talk about that for a second? What you're, what you're planning? Sure, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, we've um, figured out that uh, we're going to do this August 1st to August 10th, um, and that will start in Cusco and make its way all the way to Pumapunku in Bolivia. And then after that, we're having a four-day extension. If people choose to uh, to join with us, uh, much like we did with Megalithomania, where we went to Nazca and the Paracas area on the coast. Um, and about 90% of the people on the Megalithomania tour did join us for that one. So um, 14 days in total. And it seems like in that 14 days... You're covering a lot of territory. It, it makes it sound like all of these sites are really not all that far apart from each other. That you can do so many in, in 14 days. Yeah, that's true. Of course, uh, you know, compared to places like the United States or Canada, which are monstrously huge countries, Peru is quite small, as is Bolivia. And fortunately for us, Pumapunku and Tiwanaku are only about half an hour from the Peruvian border. So it's, um, we do, you know, at least with megalithomania, we packed a lot in every day. And um, the major remark that people had at the end uh, was that they were so happy because we basically saw everything they had ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> and more. And more. <laughs> yeah, it was like, it was 9 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock at night. <laughs> It's, but it's just because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in, insanely interested in these places that, um, you know, I could go practically every day to them, um, and that uh, became, it became very infectious with the people. Uh, we were also very fortunate to have on that trip. We had a couple of geologists and we had two engineers, and that's, you know, that's what I wanted because I'm not really an expert in anything, and. Um, I like to think of myself being humble enough that if I can't answer something, I'll find the expert. And that's where I'm very excited um, that Chris is coming because Chris is an expert. And uh, as, far, you know, as far as I'm concerned, he is the you know, number one in, in the world in terms of my choice of who I would like to uh, visit these sites with. Cool. Oh, shucks. <clears throat> right? <laughs> <Go on. laughs> I'm not worthy. <laughs> well, you know what? But I think you guys make a really great combination because, Brian, I kind of see you as being the cultural, historical, mythological piece of it, you know, because of your time there and what you've looked into. And Chris is kind of the technical end. And I think those 
two aspects would blend into a really nice broad picture of what's going on down there. Well, I think Brian brings a lot to the table, and it's not just in the area of the cultural history, but also he's a, a craftsman himself, and so he doesn't really talk that much about that. But uh, he's he's uh, he knows about the crafting, and uh, and he he. he he understands uh, the concepts of uh, precision and the concepts of what could be machine made and what what can be made by hand. So uh, he adds a lot of value in the technical area too. Well, okay, everybody, pat yourselves on the back. But we're going right. to start our virtual tour now. <laughs> okay, um, so let's start in Cusco. So. Brian, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of rely on you for some historical information. Um, what can you tell us about Cusco, history, mythology, anything? Well, the standard story is that um, the Inca originated around Lake Titicaca, which is where we find Tiwanaku, by, you know, for example. Um, and they left there about the year 900 A.D. Uh, because of a number of factors, including there was a 50-year drought that existed uh, in that area of Lake Titicaca, and so uh, they basically ran out of food. And the population of the Tiwanaku area was supposedly uh, at least 250,000 people, and could even have been a million. And now it's you know. It's just a little village. Um, so that was devastating. And then uh, so, uh, some tribal people called the Wari basically chased them out. And um, so they headed north. And where they headed was the Sacred Valley, which is just outside of Cusco, and supposedly formed Cusco around the year 1200. Um, and so that's what all of the standard um, academic texts uh, say. But if you start reading the uh, oral traditions of the people, it becomes much more complicated. And they talk of, uh, of civili uh, civilizations existing long before that. So that, uh, in fact, the Inca basically rediscovered Cusco. And that's more and more what we're seeing the more we look, is that there are buildings, especially the Coricancha, which Chris mentioned, which clearly was there prior to the Inca. Uh, because it's stated as being the first building that the Inca made, and technically it's a, it is a masterpiece of stone uh, shaping technology. So um, the more you go to Cusco, the more it becomes glaringly apparent that uh, the, the Inca were not the sole, uh, sole or first inhabitant. Somebody else was there. The trouble is we we don't have a clue uh, what name they you know what they were called. But that's what you know. That's what keeps driving me back there, is because it, you know, the, the city itself, you know, teases you constantly to solve what it is. When you are in Cusco, are there very many buildings that have the that kind of rock work, or is it just one or two? You know, what kind of uh, how many are we talking about? Well, the most astonishing thing, and again, it's after, you know, I've been to Cusco 15 times, um, and the more you visit it, the more glaring the difference in architectural styles are, th you know, are there. Uh, there's one, my favorite corner, which I'm sure Chris has seen, which is just uh, outside of the Cori Country, you see three very distinct um, forms of masonry all in the same corner. And so you see megalithic out of uh, green andesite, and then you see smaller stones which are tightly fit together right next to it um, out of, uh, I believe it's basalt. And then after that, it's field stone with uh, adobe or mud mortar. And this is within a space of about 10 feet. Mm -hmm. so, so when they say, well, you know, the Inca, you know, built all of this, you know, in the course of, you know, possibly 300 years, you say, well, you know... How could their building style so be so glaringly different? Because there's even a uh, a road, an ancient um, Inca road called um, Damn, I can't remember right now <laughs> what's it called. Um, and but uh, you, you look at the right hand side, and then you look at the left hand side. You know, and theoretically, you know, it's two basically two walls. 
And you know, you think, well, this would be built at the same time, but there, even a novice like me can look at it and go, somebody, you know, it's a very different form of technology was used to build one versus the other, and that's you know, it becomes more and more as you walk through the ancient streets of Cusco, you just see it over and over again. Chris, when you look at some of the stonework, the megalithic stonework that down there, you know, that kind of puzzle piece work, what 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 is, what is evoked in your mind? I mean, other than how the heck did they do that? <laughs> uh, precisely, how the heck did they do that? Um, you know, when I. Uh, Obviously, before you visit a place, you look at a lot of photographs, and I've, I viewed a lot of photographs, and I had certain uh, preconceived notions about what I would find. Um, but at the same time, there were, were reservations in my mind, which uh, generally um, are related to my experience in manufacturing, where things are not always as they appear to be until you actually uh, – put your hand on it and take measurements. In other words, we can't sell our products based on a photograph. We have to be able to show our customers that they uh, meet certain specifications with respect to geometry, dimensions, precision, etc. So for me, uh, to look at a photograph of some stonework, I, it, it is, it's a teaser for me. And uh, essentially what I find that I need to do and I'm compelled to do is to actually take measurements because until you know exactly what something is, it's very hard to describe uh, anything about it, particularly what it was used for. So in terms of the Inca or the pre-Inca stonework around Cusco, uh, as Brian said, you have the, the different styles and uh, when you go to Ayante Tambo, and up to the Sun Temple, you you find Inca stonework mixed in with these megalithic ancient uh, stones that are made out of granite that weigh probably about a hundred tons. Um, and when you see the difference between the two styles, you uh, you know you don't even have to be vaguely switched on to come to the understanding that you're talking about two totally different cultures and so if the uh, the field stone or the you know what the smaller elements that are put together were inca then the larger megalithic blocks that were so precisely fitted could not be inca because generally a culture that learns a superior method of construction will not resort to a, a more primitive method. Uh, they will continue to uh, evolve their technologies and techniques and continue to build using the, the knowledge that they have learned. Uh, but it's, interest, it's an interesting place. It's a, a fascinating, fascinating place. I, I didn't think that I would uh, actually become as intensely interested in Peru as I have in Egypt because uh, the, uh, uh, my times in Egypt have been uh, certainly very productive and, uh, and uh, inspiring. But the uh, And I, I really didn't see that the uh, Peru and Bolivia would have that same kind of uh, attraction to me. But as I delve deeper into it it's a it's a very mysterious place and it's a, and i find also that it, the people i'm with on on uh tours particularly engineers uh and technical type people uh get the most out of out of uh, a visit there because it really really uh sparks their brains to 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 think how it could how it could have come to be but when you look at the stonework there, I mean, granted, you know, uh, a statue of Ramses that is carved is obviously different than the stonework used in these walls. But do you see a same, a similar level of precision being that's used? A, you know, that's a, a very good question. I, I consider the the uh, Ramses statues as being a. Um, a very superior 
manufacturing uh, using very advanced techniques to to create it. To actually recreate something like that today would be enormously difficult. Uh, we could do it, but it would cost a lot of money, and it would be enormously difficult. And we would be employing all the tools that we have at our disposal in our modern day. When we go to uh, Peru and you look at the the uh, say Sacsayhuaman, that zigzag wall at Sacsayhuaman. That is a, uh, a masterpiece, but in a very different way, in that it is uh, like a, a, a crossword or a, a jigsaw puzzle where all the all the the joints are so finely fitted, but there, there's nothing regular about it. And trying to make sense of it to say, you know, did the ancients that built this wall, did they have a, a certain plan? Or was there a certain geometric protocol that they were? Uh, uh, you know, holding to, and and you can't find that. I haven't been able to find it at Sacsayhuaman. And maybe somebody will someday. But it's uh, it's a, it seems as though the the wall was built to withstand seismic forces because when you look at the way the joints are made and the way they interlock, uh, you can see that the wall would hold tightly together regardless of what forces were acting on it. So. Uh, that has risen, you know, uh, elevated the speculation that it was built for seismic purposes. Um, how it was done, I mean, there, I have ideas about how they how they could have accomplished that. Uh, and, but as far as the use of machinery, I can't really, uh, you know, machinery as we know it today. And the way axes on a particular machine tool will, will work, they work in uh, straight lines, and there are no straight lines on any of those joints. <laughs> right, Brian? Okay, good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, if, if I can just add to that, the intriguing yeah. one, one intriguing thing about Saxe Waman, which um, you know most people will be shaking or scratching their heads. Uh, but if you imagine you have a bag of marshmallows and you take the marshmallows out and make a row and then squish them together and then build another row on top of them and you squish them into different shapes, but you tightly squish them, that's what Sacsayhuaman looks like. Uh, yeah. But what, it al what also is there is a number of pictograms. So if uh, you have the right, you know, a uh, guy from Cusco, what they can show you is they can show that some in some places the wall, uh, stones in the wall form the shapes of animals like llama, fish, uh, the paw of a, of a puma and things like that. And there's another wall in Cusco um, which is called in the Inca Roca wall. And it's the same thing. It has a serpent and then on top of the serpent is a puma and on top of that is a condor all made with this astonishingly precise you know, fitting of stone. Cool. Brian, one last question before we totally go to Soxy Waman it, uh, regarding <coughs> Cusco. Has they done any excavations beneath the buildings? No, that's a great question. As far as I know, they haven't. Um, and that's a problem that we have in terms of, you know, the automatic thing, uh, you know, question people will say is, well, where are the tools? And um, what we do know is that the Inca did not have the tool technology to be able to shape um, a lot of this stone because they had bronze uh, chisels and stone hammers. That was about all they had and wooden wedges for splitting stone. But the hardness... Um, you know, the so-called Mohs scale, which goes from 1 to 10, where diamond is 10, Mo um, a lot of this stone is between 6 and 7, so it's very hard stone. Um, and so we simply don't know who or how it was done, and that's why Chris is essential <laughs> to come, <laughs> because, you know, I, I do give tours, you know, quite often to Cusco, and people want to know how it was done, and it's like, I don't know, you know. You have a mission, Chris. Um, well, like you know, but I just wonder because if there is a solid foundation in those buildings and they excavate under, they might find a different dating as well. They might find some kind of organic remains, you know, beneath that surface that they could carbon-14 date that might be more than like a 1,000 years old or 1,500 years old or whatever, 
they, they try to associate with it. Well, the amazing thing about, for example, the Cori Kancha is that Cusco is a major um, seismic zone. There was a devastating earthquake in 1950, and the, uh, there was a church that was still there, more or less built on top of the Cori Kancha, and a, a major portion of that fell down and exposed these walls, uh, so-called Inca walls, for the first time in almost 500 years. So the church wanted to rebuild it, and the city fathers and mothers of Cusco said no, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, and um, and so so the thing is that you know the Spanish construction, which is you know European construction with mortar and stone, it you know it fell down. The Coricancha underneath didn't move at all, or if it did move, the whole thing moved as if it was one piece of stone. And I think that's what uh, what Chris is is uh, getting at when he talks about being built for uh, seismic reasons, these buildings are so tight that when there's an earthquake, the whole building moves and sways as if it is a single block. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I could add something to that, Brian. I I don't know um, how valid this uh, information is, but uh, somebody was talking about uh, the Caricancha, that the walls were actually rolled on the little round balls, stone balls, so that if the earth did move, that uh, the walls were able to float. But that that was just some information I picked up when I was at uh, Cusco. Well, one thing I can uh, just quickly add to that is I've heard that, which is quite possible. Um, but one thing that we can see is that the Inca Roca wall, which is quite close, is that there are a number of shims in the bottom of the wall where the wall and the road meet. And so that's been explained to me uh, mm-hmm. by by local native people that when an earthquake happens, these little shims are basically spat out, allowing the, the wall itself to rise and fall. And afterwards, they simply would shove the shims back in again. Hmm. Wow. Well, that's... <laughs> It's a fascinating place, and there's all kinds of uh, there's plenty of room for creative minds to go down there and add their own voice and and uh, try and fathom out the puzzle. So let's move down to Saxiwaman, and there you were talking about the zigzag wall. You know, and from the pictures, it's kind of hard to tell. So I'm just going to ask the question. It seems as if the stonework in Cusco is actually smaller stones than the stonework that is in Saxiwaman. Is that correct? Um, yeah, that's absolutely correct. And people do like to throw numbers around, um, quite often impossible numbers. Um, but I have, you know, I've measured the largest stone at Saxiwaman, and based on its volume, you know, you take that and you calculate, you know, as in how many cubic feet it would be, and then you you multiply that by how much the material uh, weighs per cubic foot, and you come up with a figure of 120 tons. So that's, you know, that's like 60 or 80 automobiles. So it's, it is monumental in size, and the largest um, megalithic stone structure uh, I've ever seen. <laughs> and I'm sure it came from like 200 miles away, and they rolled it in on some wooden rollers up the hill around the corner in place, right? According to, you know, historians. Yeah, that's but, actually that's. Oh, sorry, sorry. that's that's a, that's actually more Oyente Tambo. The, supposedly, the stone for Saxewoman came from reasonably close by, but it's just the, you know, it's just the magnitude. <laughs> Of it, even if you had thousands of you know slaves, which the Inca didn't have, that's that's a whole thing that I'm debunking. I've read every um, Spanish chronicle and every account of oral tradition I can get my hands on to try to piece this whole thing together. And the Inca did not have slaves, so that that theory goes out the window. Um, you, uh, you you know you honestly have to be there and look at it, <laughs> to, and, that, and that's why people like Chris, you know, and I and Everyone are just bewildered. It's a Saxahuaman is a is a very interesting place. The when we look at the uh, the Inca slide, which is uh, as far as direction, would that be to the south of the wall, Brian? Or that's north. North, sorry, but they uh, it's an 
an extrusive rock, uh, and you can see where it had pushed up through the bedrock. Um, and the scar marks uh, can be seen on the, on this uh, extrusive rock. Uh, the um, on the on the north side of it is a slide or an area where people, you know, actually slide down, and it's a very fascinating place. But another thing that something that Brian has uh, been studying extensively are these cutouts in the rock, and they and um, they're kind of uh, very mysterious and puzzling to me. What why the uh, this ancient culture saw fit to actually make these cutouts for no seemingly no no rhyme or reason. The only thing that you can really come up with is uh, maybe it had some ceremonial purpose, but uh, definitely not not for uh, not quarry marks by any means because they're very careful cuts, aren't they, Brian? Yeah, and uh, t- just to give people a visual idea, some of these are, you know, basically the size of refrigerators, and it's as though out of a out of a rock wall, someone has cut this giant cube out, the size of a refrigerator, and the corners are always always um, have a gentle curve to them too. So it's uh, you know it looks um, almost as though a router has gone through and and you know and done this shaping. Um, it's it's just extraordinary, but that's that's one aspect uh, that most tourists don't see, and that's why my tours are a little different than the uh, conventional tours, because most guides in Cusco say that the Inca built everything, but when you ask questions, such as you know someone like Chris would ask, as how did they do this, how did they do that, they simply can't answer the question. Chris, when you look at those stones in Sasuaman, do you see any tool marks on them, or are they, you know, pretty pristine? I mean, weathered, but pristine. Well, what what you see uh, uh, on the wall, uh, the front of the wall, is like um, it's almost like unfinished stone, just uh, raw bedrock, and then um, a cut that goes down to the joint, which is finally fitted with the next stone, but the uh, Right where the, the face of the of the two stones meet, you'll see uh, maybe some hammer marks or chisel marks that uh, have, have been used to chip away the material to so that a, a, a common line is achieved between two adjoining blocks. Uh, as far as the joint themselves, there are uh, some blocks that you'll find that where you can visual the uh, the uh, Area of where the the joint would be, and they don't they they don't there doesn't appear to be any tool marks on those. Uh, it has given rise to a lot of speculation on how it was done. I know that uh, there have been studies by academics uh, on how the these uh, blocks were cut and fitted together. The conventional theory is that they uh, they used a harder stone to bash the the block out and. And that is that kind of uh, theory is uh, they support that theory with the evidence that the joints on the adjoining the adjoining blocks do not go all the way through to the back of the stone. That there's just a small area at the front of the face of the stone where these joints are actually so precise. Um, other theories are that they uh, use sun dishes to uh, burn the stone, or uh, they call it ablation, where you uh, direct sufficient heat uh, to elevate the temperature of the stone, and it will basically explode away from the uh, the, the, the material. And, and what kind of temperature are we talking about to make these stones explode, roughly? I, I don't. I really can't answer that question. Um, I, I think though I don't think that that has been demonstrated successfully. There was a, a a researcher called Watkins, I believe his name is, um, who uh, he participated in a documentary about twenty, maybe thirty years ago. It's, it's been a long time, uh, but he did some experiments with a, with a a, a dish, uh, a reflect a reflective dish. Um, I don't think he achieved that much success with it. So um, it's it's very difficult to 
come up with a, a true method. And when you look at the surface of the rock itself, it doesn't look vitrified, and it doesn't look like it's been melted or uh, anything like that. It looks like it's, you know, just been cut. So the tool marks are uh, uh, a bit of a puzzle. Um, the the method, what they, you know, how they were guided, uh, that's another another puzzle. I think there are some uh, answers to the. I mean, there are ways that we can, you can do that. Uh, if you have um, the blocks lying down rather than, you know, trying to fit them when they're stood up. If you build a frame and you're actually able to uh, craft the the block and then just slide it into position uh, to fit it to the adjoining block without having to lift it up. It's, it's just roll it in on maybe rollers and uh, fit it that way. That's a, and then once you've got all your, all your stones fitted on the ground laying flat, then you, uh, fit them in the wall you build the wall up so you don't have to do any any uh cutting after after that you just uh you just elevate the blocks and they they fit together perfectly so that's that's just a possible way that they they could have been done it certainly make it a lot easier for us to do it that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> i can't even imagine us doing it um one last question before i go back to you brian um in the in the joints, or either of you can answer in the joints because you said this wall is zigzag. So when you have you know a zig in the zag in that quarter, do you find the same level of precision of you know these two angled surfaces coming together and the blocks being cut to fit appropriately? Especially the inter especially the internal zigs, not the external zigs. Zag. Take, take it away, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> That's a technical question. <laughs> the internal zigs. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that question? <laughs> <laughs> well, you said that the structure is zigzag, so there are the you know the pointed parts of the zigzag, and then there is the internal bend oh, know, right. where the walls meet. Do you find the same level of precision? Yes. In those joints as well. Yes, and the interesting thing about the uh, the internal corners is the, uh, that some of the blocks actually fold around the corners, so they can be going, say, uh, directed south, and then they will be directed east. Uh, but the same the same megalithic block will they will form a part of the uh, of both both the walls. So there's a right angle at the bottom of it. Cool. Uh, yeah, and you know the uh, the external the external stones wrap around, and the internal stones uh, the internal walls the internal corners are, are wrap around too. And you find that also in uh, in Egypt there is the uh, the Valley Temple at Giza that has these re-entry. Uh, angles on them where one stone forms a part of uh, both sides of the wall. Interesting. Uh, Brian, we didn't really talk about what this structure, site, you know, there, you know, I always like to joke around, there's what they say it's supposed to be, and then there's like what the real people know. So what do they say it was supposed to be, and then what does, you know, the indigenous culture say it's supposed to be? Well, they basically say that Sacsayhuaman was a fortress because it's on top of a hill. And that is something that the Spanish wrote. Um, one thing to take into consideration is the fact that uh, the early Spanish chroniclers, of course, learned their information from the native Inca descendants. So any knowledge would have gone from the Quechua language to the Spanish language and then when we read it, it goes into the English language. So there isn't necessarily, you know, a, a clean translation going through. And what I'm speculating now is that um, uh, it's, you know, it's said that one specific Inca ruler, you know, had it built. Uh, but what I think it, it may be a, a language misinterpretation uh, because you see so many different styles there. You do see what we know now is the Inca style. So I think... Um, 
the translation was was uh, messed up a little, and rather than saying that uh, you know Pachacutec built Sacsayhuaman, it was probably Pachacutec built at Sacsayhuaman. Uh, and the, the other, you know, the, especially the big wall, which actually is three diff- three uh, tiers. The largest stones are the first tier, and then there's the second and the third. And that, um, you know, the Inca definitely built a lot of things there, but the first, uh, or th- those three walls are spoken of as having been built by so-called giants. And again, whether giants mean giant people or giants as in giant mines, we don't know. But it's clearly you know, ind- indicated that somebody else was responsible because the Spanish were in complete shock when they saw it uh, in their very racist way saying, you know, you couldn't have built this. And the Inca said, no, we didn't. I love the Spanish chroniclers. They crack me up. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like... This wall, I mean, is it a terrace thing, or is it actually like a wall around a, you know, that you would think of like a castle wall? You know, is it empty on the backside, or is there actually like a terrace that it's kind of holding up? Really hard to uh, tell from pictures. Yeah, it looks it, it looks like a terrace in that way. Um, as I said, three distinct levels. It's it's one, you know, it's one uh, zigzag wall with two on top of it. And the, um, ama- you know, the, the amazing thing is uh, there's a oral traditions expert, Jesus Gamara, who lives in Cusco, and he guided me uh, around Saxe Woman for one day. And he said that actually the whole hill that Saxe Woman is on is a pyramid. <clears throat> and he sh- uh, as we walk down through the uh, you know the steep streets to get down back into Cusco again, we walked in, into a restaurant that had the same construction, and he said this also is part of Sacsayhuaman. So he believes that a lot of um, the megalithic wall is uh, buried um, and still exists there. Sacsayhuaman could be much bigger than we think it is, but not really any plans to do any work there. Really? No, they don't. They they do very little work um, in the in the any of these structures. Uh, they're doing some at Sacsayhuaman now, and it's quite a huge site. Uh, and a little bit at Oyente Tambo, which is like 1,200 acres in size. It's huge. Um, but the, yeah, the Peruvian government isn't all that big on spending money on uh, archaeology, unfortunately. Machu Picchu is is kept pristine, but the rest of them. You know, kind of sit there, which saddens saddens me. It seems like, however, that there has been a lot more interest. You know, and I don't know if it's the 2012 thing or what, but in South America, you know, in uh, Mayan and Aztec and Peruvian Inca cultures, that you would think there would be more, you know, colleges or organizations that would want to come in and do work if they got permission. Well, yeah, there is, but get, you know, without getting too political, getting permission is very difficult. Um, and with the at present economic situation, especially in the U.S. and Europe, you know, there just isn't, I guess, money, money for it. There's, you know, centuries worth of, of archaeology to do uh, in Peru and Bolivia. Yeah, but just think how fun that would be. <laughs> Well, the 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 thing that that scares me the most is going to these places and not seeing something that I haven't seen before. And every time I go to these places, I always see something and smack myself in the head, saying, "Why didn't I see that?" It just it goes on forever. This stuff. Cool, Chris. One last question before we move on from Saxi Waman. Is it would it be possible for us to build a wall or replicate this wall today? Would it be possible? It would be enormously expensive. Um, I I believe it would be possible, but it would be enormously expensive. And getting the resources uh, to do it, um, I'm not sure that we could we would be able to do that. But I, I mean, you could you could say that for most of the sites that you visit, these ancient uh, construction that the uh, they. My my belief is that they must have had some kind of lifting technology that we don't we haven't quite uh, been able to recapture. 
um, because it's almost as though they they were moving these multi-ton blocks around with relative ease. And when we think about primitive cultures and how they, I mean, even going back to the Spanish and, you know, the Europeans, they didn't select uh, hundred ton elements uh, in their construction. They, uh, they would select smaller elements, even the more advanced construction styles that you see in Cusco by the Spanish, as opposed to the Inca, uh, they're all small elements compared to the megalithic, uh, huge multi-ton blocks that the pre-Incas uh, were using. So I mean, it's my firm belief that what we have from the past, from history, is a world, uh, a knowledge that was prevalent in the world at large, and, and that was how, how to lift uh, multi-ton blocks with relative ease because it, when you go further back in time, that is how they built. That's how they con- made, uh, built their constructions with, uh, an ob- you know, the obelisks in Egypt, the uh, the Jupiter Temple at uh, Baalbek, where you have the 1,200-ton uh, stone. Uh, Everything is 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 megaton megaton construction, and uh, how do they how do they lift them into place? I mean that's that that is the huge puzzle. I think we we can certainly figure out how to cut them or how to uh, craft them, but uh, actually uh, lifting them into place is another matter altogether. When you look, and this is for either of you, when you look at the stonework, like at Saksiwaman or some of the other sites that are in South America, that megalithic construction and compare it to um, like the construction in Egypt on the pyramids or a Temple of Jupiter would be another good example, do you get a sense that you know perhaps the stonework that's in South America might be older just based on style? Um, Ignoring the you know the dates, let's you know just move those yeah. to the side and just based on what you're seeing. Well, I, I can say that from you know the from my perspective, Egypt uh, whether whether you're in Egypt and uh, in England, you know near Stonehenge or uh, Baalbek, uh, Gobekli Tepe, Gobekli Tepe is also is also has been found to be many thousands of years older than even the pyramids uh, are reported to be. And I think there's a lot of confusion in dates. Um, and I think the uh, really the, the clue to answering the question about age has to be in the technology that was being used. And uh, I, w- I definitely believe that this culture was ancient, but I also believe that the ancient Egyptians were also uh, an ancient culture or the Comitians as they as they were known at that time how 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 old that's another question I mean some people uh, push the dates back to over 10,000 years uh, the Egyptian pre uh, pre-egyptian culture back 30 35,000 years or 36,000 years so you know it's hard to say uh, because when we look at the, uh, the, the cataclysmic events that have occurred uh, on our planet, I can envision a civilization, that a, even our civilization, is, uh, is at risk of uh, cataclysmic forces just totally wiping us off the face of the map. And uh, we, th- we talk about that, we, specula- we speculate about what would happen to our civilization should that happen. And we accept that it would be, uh, you know, a, an extinction event, uh, and there won't be much left after a few hundred years. Uh, it's very difficult for us to accept that the same thing happened to advanced cultures in prehistory, uh, uh, or that uh, prehistoric prehistoric cultures rose to a level of technology that we find extremely challenging today when we're when we're looking at it. But uh, I think that the culture um, that shared this technology, as particularly the uh, 
the lifting and uh, carrying technologies uh, probably existed around the same time, or you know they were sharing the same information. Okay. Any comment, Brian, before we move on? Well, definitely. Um, I really, the more that I, you know, research it and think about it and ask um, ask uh, people about it, there's, you know, there is this recurring theme of a of a global flood, even in the oral traditions of the the people of the Andes. They speak of, you know, that there was a great flood that, de- you know, that devastated and and destroyed, you know, the so-called giant uh, culture, and um, you know, I have no uh, qualms whatsoever to um, believe that some of these structures predate um, 10,000 years. Uh, the thing is that there's a, you know, there's a natural prejudice that we have uh, thinking that we are the greatest, you know, the most sophisticated people of all time, and in almost any native tradition, they all they speak of, and you know, I've studied many different native uh, cultures. They always say that that civilizations are um, basically like waves, or you know, everything comes in cycle or happens in cycles. And so, um, I have no, you know, as I say, no qualms whatsoever to to go back to twelve thousand, you know, twelve thousand or, or whatever age, um, because the evidence is staring us in the face. In stone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's jump to Tiwanaku. So I'm going to just leave it with you, Brian, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about the history, mythology that's associated with that location. Well, it's uh, it's so intriguing. Um, Tiwanaku and Pumapunku are both located. <clears throat> on the same, you know, it's the same site basically. They're just given different, uh, different names. Um, about ninety percent of the people who go to Tiwanaku, which is, you know, in the Altiplano, which is the high, you know, high area, uh, approximately twelve thousand foot altitude. It's a, uh, it's a less than ten miles away from Lake Titicaca now, and um, the conventional, you know, story is that it was its construction started in the Oh, more or less about 2,000 years ago. Um, but the, I was just there with David Childress um, uh, filming Ancient Aliens in November with uh, Hugh Newman. And every time I go there, it's just, it you know, the place just bewilders me because the level of possible technology that would have been employed is simply mind blowing as chris said you know i have some technical aspect because i was a, a precision cabinet maker as in furniture maker and it in that you know a millimeter is a big distance um 90 degree uh cuts mean 90 degrees if if you're at 89 or 91 you've made a mistake so at least my eye is trained enough to be able to see uh you know see precision when i'm looking at it and um, Tiwanaku and Pumapunku just are odd. <laughs> well, and I want to do Pumapunku separate because I got a bunch of questions for Chris. So we'll come okay. back to that. But when I look at images of Tiwanaku, I mean, it, they just seem very bizarre, like there's this kind of hodgepodge of construction going on. Yeah, well, that the thing is there, and it's also true in the Sacred Valley and Cusco and many places, you see obvious evidence of the fact that many cultures with uh, different um, ways of approaching construction existed. And that's why, it, you know, often these places look like a mess when you really look at them, especially Cusco, again, where you see very rough adobe next door to, you know, literally next door to megalithic building. And, uh, you know, when the conventional scholars say, well, you know, it all happened over the course of 300 years, nobody either evolves or devolves that fast. Um, so the thing about Tiwanaku is that my belief now is that there were very distinct periods of building there. And, I, you know, I personally call the first... Uh, age of building the, the Pumapunku period because you see the exact same 
style of of work in stone at Tiwanaku as well as at Pumapunku, and then and that's in so-called diorite, which it's not technically diorite, but it's a very hard gray stone. And next you find a lot of red sandstone construction. And then after that, um, adobe. The the so-called diorite comes from 90 kilometers away, um, whereas the sandstone comes from about 10 kilometers away. It's um, yeah, it's uh, it it looks like a mess, but that's what why it's so intriguing because uh, you'll fi- you just find so many odd things like six feet you know walls of mud, and then you'll see this huge chunk of precision stone sticking out of it as if a you know as if a flood occurred. Okay, and you know what? We need to take a break here, and so why don't we go ahead and do that now and then come back with some more questions about Tiwanaku as opposed to going, oh, got to take a break Um, in the middle while somebody's talking about something. Sound good? Sure, sure. And hopefully the music. So, guys, before we went to a break, we were talking about Tiwanaku, and... Chris, you never really said what they say this structure was used for. So what's the mythology associated with it? As far as uh, Tiwanaku? Mm-hmm. I, uh, I I don't know what the mythology says about it. Uh, I, I know exactly, well, not exactly, but I have ideas about uh, what it was used for. Um the Tiwanaku site, uh, as Brian said, is uh, shows the evidence of a some kind of a mud flow or cataclysm in prehistory, where you do have these very finely tooled blocks sitting on pillars of mud. Uh, it appears that there is a pyramid at Tiwanaku, and uh, also a uh, what is considered to be an underground temple. But there's some very uh, unique. Uh, blocks of stone uh, at Tiwanaku, uh, but more so at Pumapunku, which if you consider that to be a part of the, uh, you know, the same kind of uh, construction or the the same facility, then uh, I, my interest was really piqued when I went to uh, Pumapunku. Yeah, and I got questions for you there, but let me ask you this, because I had this question for you, because I'm assuming you've gone to Stonehenge? I've been to uh, I've been by Stonehenge. I have not actually visited. Been on on the on the grounds at the side. I just drove by okay. on the motorway. Well, I'm going to ask you the question anyway because when I look at those upright stones in Tiwanaku, they look kind of old and weathered compared to the other stones, the smaller stones around them. I mean, did you have you had a chance to look at those uprights, and do they seem like they have experienced a lot of weathering with, in relationship to the other stones next to it? Uh, yeah, there, I mean, a lot of the stones that you find at Tiwanaku and Pumapunku uh, uh, have the appearance of uh, weathering. Some of them uh, appear to have been uncovered recently and don't have the same kind of weathering. Um uh, so it's hard to say because there is work uh, going on there. But it's not very active, as Brian said. There doesn't seem to be that much money to invest in archaeological studies. But uh, I know that uh, they they were working at Tiwanaku uh, and at Pumapunku. You see a, a mixed bag uh, where you have some stones that show, you know, the they seem to be very old and weathered and others seem to be relatively just like they were cut yesterday. Um, so it's a mixed bag. And, you know, it's a puzzle to me. The um, the function of, of Pumapunku, though, is more my uh, my interest because uh, what, what we see, uh, what we've seen on the uh, on the Internet, we find a, a lot of um, drawings of the blocks. Of Puma Punku and a very unusual block, something that has interested both Brian and myself. I mean, we're both fascinated by, you know, exactly what this site was for and uh, what what function the block served. And because of photographs uh, not being sufficient for me, I, in, uh, early this year I took some uh, measuring instruments to 
Bolivia, uh, inside micrometers and uh, berniers, and also indicator gauges to ch check the, the flatness of surfaces. And so I was able to take some measurements at Puma Punku that, uh, and I, w I was really surprised by what I found because it's not at all like what has been uh, illustrated. Um, and the, uh, the conclusion I came to was that, you know, I, mean, I couldn't really support the idea that they uh, they were using machines to create these things, uh, particularly the H blocks or the internal cavities on the H blocks. They are different dimensions. They're not parallel surfaces. Uh, some of the blocks are extremely have inside corners that are extremely square, uh, and others are on angles. So it's a it was a huge puzzle. And see, and that was one of my questions because you see images of those stones that have like the uh, recessed crosses, you know, and then there's another recess behind that, and they're kind of in a row or, you know, in kind of a parallel design on different stones. And I was wondering if you had a chance to measure um, those elements, you know, and then look at multiple ones to see if you saw the same kind of. Uh, measurement, you know, one detail to the next? Uh, well, that's exactly what I did. Uh, that uh, was my intention to see if there was a consistency between one store, one block and the next. And uh, what I found was that, say, if you're looking at the H blocks and you're looking at the recesses, you've got one on the top and one on the bottom. Um they uh, they are actually cut like dovetails. And so on one block, uh, you would have an opening at the front uh, with a dimension of 9.5 inches. The dimension uh, to, uh, towards the back where, of the opening is 9.8 inches. So uh, that's on one block. On another block, the opening at the front was 9.7 inches which is a 200,000 difference. And then on another block, yet again, you have a dimension of 9.4. And then another block is 9.3. But uh, consistently, the, the uh, dimension at the back of these cavities uh, is always about 300, <coughs> excuse me, 300 thousandths bigger than the opening at the front. And, and so the question is, what, why? What, what were they using that for? What, what was the purpose for it? There was a lot of, there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding and speculation that basically is, is going to be uh, clarified uh, by this, this data. One of them is the, uh, the, the construction method, because there was some theories out there that they were, they were poured in molds. They didn't uh, look that way. Uh, they have the appearance uh, consi of consistency from one block to the other, but it's only when you actually take your measurements that you find out that, that that's a uh, just an illusion. It's not. It's not. You know the uh, the devil's in the details, as they say, reader, and the uh, <laughs> and the details tell us that uh, those theories that we you know that we dearly love and uh, are not necessarily supported by the evidence. Um, but yeah, they, it's interesting. I mean, you know, a lot of the uh, what you find on the internet of, or ideas of what these blocks were used for, uh, you, you see them uh, as architectural elements in a in a wall, and they, you know, they look kind of interesting and unique, kind of Frank Lloyd Wrightish, and uh, and but there's only six of the blocks of these H blocks. Um, and you don't build a complete wall with just six blocks. The other uh, speculation was that because they do appear to have the same shapes, that they may be interlocking. But uh, I didn't find any interlocking feature or anything about them that would uh, allow them to interlock because of the varying dimensions. So then the question is, well, what were they for? That's well, going to be the big question. 
Yeah. And on uh, one, <clears throat> if you look at the uh, the inside of the cavities, uh, you'll see that there is a another cutout at the at the bottom of these cavities, and it's like uh, an image that you would find in, or a um, a feature that you would find in Egypt. And they call in Egypt they call it the false door, and these look like little cuts that were made at the bottom that had the appearance of uh, a door. Uh, you have the transom at the top and the vertical members and then just a, a little door shape uh, cut cut uh, deeper into the rock. Uh, what was that for? <clears throat> you know, I mean, generally speaking, when you go to that kind of effort, you have a, a reason for it. It's either decorative or, or functional. And I came to the conclusion that, uh, that it was actually both. I mean, what we have with this block is a combination of uh, of symbolic and also uh, functional. And interestingly, uh, I'll just give a plug for the show that uh, Brian was talking about earlier. The Ancient Aliens or was in was uh, interviewing me a couple of weekends ago, and uh, I had actually made a model of uh, one of these blocks. Uh, with the correct geometries, and uh, also had had a uh, a little extra uh, showing what they potential or possibly could have been used for, and what they were used for, in my opinion, is not uh, was not to build a wall, but to to certainly be a part of a doorway. Uh, where you had three of these on both sides of an opening, a very large opening, and they were used as hinge blocks. So the dovetails allowed other members to fit in them and be locked into place, but the uh, but they would have hinges on them that were uh, obviously massive hinges uh, for a, 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 a gigantic door or a pair of doors that swung swung out. So. It seems that the that the uh, the elements that we find at Puma Punku had both decorative and uh, mechanical purposes. The question is, you know, putting everything everything together, and uh, you know, the only way you can do that is actually measure it, take the dimensions, and uh, see see how things fit together. The part that I find really interesting about Puma Punku is that stylistically, it doesn't fit with any of the other architecture that you find in the region, which I find is an even bigger mystery. Oh, and I, and, you know, I'll get to tell you a little story. I was, uh, I was going, I was with uh, Dave Childress in 2005, and I've been through uh, Peru, and the only, the only thing that I could really say may have been, ad, you know, advanced was the uh, the flatness of the surf some of the surfaces um and so when we when we got to Bolivia, I had a precision square and a precision straight edge which uh is was sufficient to uh actually check do a spot check of a of a surface to see how flat it was uh but we went to La Paz and uh I'd left in my suitcase uh some other instruments that I had taken along because I hadn't found it necessary to use them um, in Peru. So I didn't want to carry the weight out to Tiwanaku. I was expecting to find more of the same. And then I went to Puma Punku and I, my mind was blown away. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, my God, what have we got here? Uh, and it's not just these these H blocks that are, you know, very interesting, but there's a lot of other Artifacts at, uh, at Puma Punku that show signs of, uh, you know, classical signs of machining. Uh, but the kind of machining that we're talking about is, you know, when we look at the H blocks, we have very, very sharp internal internal corners, and uh, the conventional machining that we use is uh, it usually involves rotating tools. And uh, this, these shapes indicate that uh, rotating tools would not achieve the kind of geometries and sharpness that what we see there. So it's almost like 
you know, they had some special tools that were that, that were used to craft, cut away the stone, leaving very flat surfaces, uh, very very sharp inside corners, but um, you know, like uh, the corners on these H blocks are compound angle surfaces that uh, you know where you have three surfaces coming together at a point and uh, they're all on different angles and you know that kind of uh, geometry is uh, requires a new uh, special tools to to accomplish and even and even academics accept that uh, puma punku uh, the you know the the history books are generally uh, uh, thrown out the window uh the the uh, the tools to craft those stones are not in the archaeological record that they had to have had uh more superior tools uh, when when these stones were made well they just ignore it completely and then they don't talk about it yeah they say well i don't know and then they don't talk about it but we do i mean you know but <laughs> <laughs> the good people Brian, well, are you there yes ma'am all right cuz you've been very quiet <laughs> What do they? What do the locals say about it? Because it does, you know, like I was saying earlier, you know, Puma Punko, if it's right next to Tiwanaku, they they're like worlds apart. Yeah, well, like I was saying, you there are stones very much like what you see at Puma Punku, sort of scattered around Tiwanaku. Um, the interesting thing is that none of the stones seem to be in their original place, as if they, you know, as if a flood or something moved them, except for some of the massive uh, sandstone blocks, uh, you know, that look like foundation blocks, some of the, you know, some weighing 100 tons, um, you know, they they look like they've sunk a little bit, but it, you know, it definitely looks like something very catastrophic happened there. The intriguing thing about the actual history is that in the museum uh, again they state well the you know the first people came somewhere around you know possibly 200 BC or 200 AD and started building this and and they you know the drawings they show are are, are literally of native people with ponytails in in loincloths with stone hammers <clears throat> you know pounding away trying to make this which is completely ridiculous but the important thing is that um the people who live there now are the um, Aymara people. And as far as I can tell, they've only been there since about, again, going back to the Inca, since about 900 AD when they uh, probably kicked the Inca out of the area. So there are no um, super ancient dis uh, descendants of super ancient cultures there, It's uh, which, again, is something you find in the area. You, uh, when people say, you know uh that the Nazca built something or or whatever they're not taking into account the waves of civilizations that come and go um so the local yeah the local people don't really know anything about it and it's as mysterious to them as it is to everyone else and uh just like what you and Chris have said the academics are just they they simply uh, to some extent, try not to approach the subject, especially of Puma Punku, because it's it's just simply odd and and completely unique. You you don't see anything um, around uh, the Sacred Valley or Cusco, but or in South America, except possibly a few little examples at Oyente Tambo of of a uh, similar building style. It's as if someone came and built Puma Punku. And that's the only construction that they ever did. Or it was either way earlier or way older <laughs> than the other stuff. Mm. Yeah, I well, I think definitely it's it's the oldest, and the and that's the funny thing. It's the oldest and the most precise. So it's as it's as though humanity de, you know devolved through time, and that's again what Cusco is. Uh, you know, the Spanish built beautiful buildings. Uh, but they uh, they use so much mortar. In some cases, the mortar is an inch thick to fit the blocks together, um, which they was all recycled from Inca buildings. But when it when it came to places like Sacsayhuaman, because of the size of the stone, they didn't bother touching them because they couldn't deal 
with cutting stone of that size. So that's the only reason we still have Sacsayhuaman is because no one's been able to uh, <laughs> comprehend how they could, uh, you know, move those stones and, and cut them up. At this site, I mean, how much stone is left? Is there enough for them to try to do some kind of a reconstruction effort, or is it just miscellaneous pieces kind of laying around? No, that's the absolute best question, because as far as I can tell, at least 90% possibly of Pumapunku is no longer there. It was heavily... Uh, chopped and smashed up um, since the time of the Spanish who arrived in the 16th century and ever since then it's it's been used as a quarry ever since then including and you know it's really uh, disgusting but they also made the railway bed out of Puma Punku um, so in order to prove that theory um, I walked along the, the railroad tracks and every once about every 10 feet I would lean down and pick up you know, the corner of a so-called diorite block, which obviously came from Pumapunku, and also the little village that's there um, of Tiwanaku, they built their church out of Tiwanaku and Pumapunku stone, uh, as well as buildings in uh, La Paz. So, you know, what is left is a very small percentage of what originally would have been there. It's sounding like this structure might have been pretty massive if they quarried that much material out of it. Uh, it it may very well have been, um, but the you know the fun thing is because of the you know the gray color of the stone and the and the precision of it, um, you can go for example to the little church at Tiwanaku and just look at the wall and you can see pieces of Puma Punku, including drill holes and things in them. Uh, that, that's a subject that uh, or, uh, that we haven't brought up, and that's the fact that you know because I was a cabinet maker and sculptor, I use drills a lot. So there are a lot of examples of what look to me like high speed drills um, for a varying size. Some are you know uh, maybe an eighth of an inch in diameter, and others are several inches. Um, and the, you know they look like core drills have been used to to plow into the into the stone, and there are uh cases where on a couple of uh of the uh of the larger stones where you see hundreds of little drill holes all the same drill bit being used and that was not a piece you know that that was not a piece of um obsidian lashed to a you know to a wooden um twig and then twisted with your hands this is you know this is precision technology at work in one image, and I'm just going to say that you put on Facebook, there was an image of a stone that had a round hole, and uh, I'm just going to like throw out a number. You know, it might have been like an inch and a half or two inches in diameter that looked like it went through a block that might have been like three or four feet long, you know, with some grooves in it. I don't know. I'm just, you know, throwing it out there. But I think you know which picture I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually, that's at the Cori Cancha, and it's the only one of its, you know, I've scoured the place trying to find more. It's it's the only one of its kind, and it's about two, it's over two feet long, this, you know, this perfectly, or not, you shouldn't use the word perfect, but this this well-drilled um, hole with four, you know, at least four grooves as if some kind of material was caught in the, in the bit as it was um, moving through the surface. But the, uh, that's the front end, and the back end of the block is broken, so we have no idea how long you know that tube uh, core was. Well, and the question I have, and I, you know, either of you can answer this. Um, I don't know if if you've seen it, Chris, or maybe just saw the pictures. Is you know, if you're drilling something, and especially if it's really long, then the drill has a tendency to kind of waver, you know, or it could have that tendency to waver, um, you know, especially if you're just doing it with, like, some little hand drill, you know, how straight was the the hole? I mean, two feet or two and a half feet a long distance to travel without it, you know, giving you some kind of wavering. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I think in stone, if you if you have a, uh, a drill bit that, that is that's that big a diameter, you, you generally you, you you should be able to achieve a, very, a pretty straight uh, hole. Then uh, other materials 
or if you have a smaller drill, the drill might might bend and uh, waver off off the path. But in stone, uh, uh, if you have a fairly rigid drill, you'll get a straight hole. On the uh, that particular hole, it reminds me of the Egyptian holes uh, where you, that you find at Giza, also at uh, Abu Ghraib, Abu Sir, and uh, the uh, these holes show the it, they do seem to show the same uh, striations uh, around the, uh, the, per, the circumference of the hole. The only question is, I, we know that the ancient Egyptians had, that those were spiral grooves. In other words, the drill was advancing into the material at a fairly rapid rate. Um, uh, but there's been a lot of study done on that. And, uh, and before that could be concluded, you pretty much have to take an impression of the inside of the hole and then uh, try to determine if those uh, feed lines or the grooves are, are uh, horizontal or if they're helical. Uh, it's a an important question to answer because that would indicate that would give you a better understanding of what uh, you know the technology is or may have been. Uh, because drilling into into that kind of stone. Uh, in a primitive way, where, whether it be using a copper and sand, uh, you would, you, you generally, you, you're not going to have the kind of grooves that you see, uh, in Egypt or in these, these, uh, holes at the Kari Kantra. So it's a, that's still a part, that's a part of the investigation and the ongoing investigation into that area. And that's what I'd be interested in. I mean, if we could, uh, when we go in uh, in August, if we're able to get a uh, an impression of the inside of the the, the hole, and then uh, and then examine the uh, the results, uh, that we would know more about the, the the precision of it and the uh, and the, the other characteristics of the hole. Sounds like you're going to be bringing your whole lab down there. <laughs> well, <laughs> as I have done in the past, I have taken what in, uh, instruments I can carry, and uh, and and then uh, part of the study, I, I normally I'll take some forming wax. Uh, in this case, it would be good to have some uh, another kind of uh, uh, maybe some dental material, dental wax, to uh, fill fill the hole and be able to extract it and examine it. Uh, under the microscope, back in the lab. So I won't be taking the lab, but I'll definitely be using it when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Any last comments about Tiwanaku or – well, actually, I have one more question about Tiwanaku, so I'm going to jump back. Um, Brian, I've heard stories that um, in Tiwanaku that there was actually reconstruction done and those stone faces that are in the wall – were not originally there. Is that true? As, yeah, as far as I can tell, the the real tragedy, and um, it's in a little ebook I wrote about Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, where I have 19th century photographs of it, and it shows what it looked like. And basically, at Tiwanaku, all there were were the standing stones, especially at the Kala Sasaya, which is the largest of the structures. I think in the, it was in the 1950s that the archaeologists of the time decided to take a lot of the stone that was lying around and fill in between the standing stones, creating walls. And that, again, is where we find a lot of um, pumapunku material because you'll see rough, rough-ish uh, red sandstone blocks. And then once in a while you'll see one of these beautiful gray ones, which you know is pumapunku with the perfect, you know, or with the flat surfaces. And so, uh, unfortunately, that's also something that most of the guides don't talk about. But uh, the 19th century photographs that I, you know, that I have um, show that, including the, the Gate of the Sun, which is, you know, the most famous feature there. Um, I have a photograph or two showing that it was half sunken into the ground and that the break in it, because it's in two pieces, the break uh, was probably the result um, of some prehistorical um, 
uh, event, uh, uh, as in a massive um, earthquake or, or flood or a combination of the two. When you look, I, I have one more question about, or maybe not more, just one question. But when I look at it, I keep getting struck by those upright stones, and it just seems to me, why would they carve these upright stones and then not have them be, like, square or straight? Or some of them look straight, and then other ones look like, you know, they're just kind of these rough-hewn stones. But then, you know, because I'm just looking at pictures again, you know, it could be that the stones are just so old that they're weathered into these not square stones anymore. Yeah, I think so. I think that's definitely what you see the more you look at it, is you see incredibly he uh, heavy weathering patterns on them. Um, so what they originally looked like, I don't know, but that's, you know, that's a telltale sign to a, again, to a, a novice like me that... Um, Parts of that, you know, parts of the construction there are are incredibly ancient. See, and then it just makes me think, well, part of me goes, okay, you look at a site like Stonehenge, and you go, why would these people create this massive structure and then just do a kind of crappy job cutting out the rocks, you know, but on the top, they have the lintels with the, you know, the little piece of stone sticking out and the hole that fits perfectly so that they don't fall apart. It's like, it, it doesn't make sense to me mm -hmm. why they would do two different levels of engineering in the same thing unless they were better. You know, they did look differently and are just so old that they've been weathered down to the shape they are now. Yeah, well, I've I've been to Stonehenge a couple of times, and it's you know it's very impressive, but in comparison, some of the you know I don't want to put a judgment on it, but it's just in comparison, some of the things that we see around Cusco, the Sacred Valley, Tiwanaku, and Pumapunku are simply surreal. They're you know completely different. They're um, you know. Everyone scratches their head when they go, even, you know, brilliant engineers like Chris Dunn. It's like, <laughs> and that's why I keep going back, because it's just, you know, what is this place? Why am I so stupid that I can't figure it out? It's like, well, no one has. But, you know, the great thing is that, uh, you know, Chris, you know, what's wonderful amongst any or other things with this tour is that Chris will be doing actual research, what, you know, while we're there, which I'm incredibly excited about. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> it's it's a real mystery, and you know some of the questions you've asked the uh, reader are, are very uh, are very pertinent, and <clears throat> certainly the same questions that I've asked: Why do we have seemingly very rough stones that are uh, not regular shaped, and and next to them we have this very finely finished, uh, almost perfect, perfectly flat stonework? Why? That's the question. Oh, well, you don't have any, like, novel insights into that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, wait, I, that's what you're working on. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, my my uh, insight as, a, as an engineer uh, is, uh, and an observer of our modern world and the way we do things, we... Uh, we only craft precision into an object if it's uh, ne absolutely necessary. And so if you are, have a, you know, if you want to um, have a piece that uh, holds up a roof or it has a, uh, you know, it has a function that is not, doesn't, doesn't require it to be very precise, then why make it precise? So, you know, if, so if you've got a, a stone that, you can uh, rough shape on the four sides, but it may be uh, a little rough on, you know, in parts of it. Uh, but it's going to do the job. Then, then you put that into place. And if you've got a uh, something that you have, uh, you want to use as a uh, for a mechanical purpose, like a uh, to contain hinges for a door, then you would make it a little more precisely. If you have other features that may be used to channel water or, you know, that <clears throat> may have some other function, um, 
then, you know, that's why you have such a, a mixed bag. Uh, you have uh, all kinds of uh, different looking pieces, looking, looking stone, but they could all be in this, be within the same structure, but serving a different purpose. It's like, um, you know, a lot of people will look at primitive marks or marks that could be made without machine work and say, well, because these exist, then that's how they must have created the other features of a particular block. And uh, there is a one, one block at Pumapunku that shows clearly that it had to have been, it looked like it just came off a milling machine. I mean, the, the, uh, the shape of it, the geometry, the precision of it. But also, in that same stone, you have a rough-looking hole drilled through the center of it and a groove leading from that hole. And you can't judge the the whole uh, the whole culture just by one uh, you know that particular feature the feature of of, of rough primitive type work uh, because even today what you have is you you have standard millwork or you know the uh, you you'll have construction elements that are sent out from a factory to a building site. And the uh, the factory work may be tightly controlled and uh, machine made, but when it gets to the building site, then the uh, the builders get get to work on it and they customize it uh, to do whatever job they want it to do, which may include uh, cutting it with a torch or you know cutting holes in it, uh, changing it in some way uh, to fit to fit it to, to that purpose. So you have, you do have a mixture of handwork and machine work, even even in today's culture. Well, maybe some of the people making it were just more OC than the other people. I mean, I, there would be definitely a big difference between you making something and me making something because, you know, tolerance is not my favorite thing. It's like, well, yeah, there's there's my big old fat pencil line. You know? well, I, I don't know. Uh, you you must be very intuitive, or you actually know the uh, the division of classes in a, in a manufacturing talks <laughs> Louis, because I was a makes... mechanical designer for years, so yes, well, that, I, well, I, I do get it. So you do get it, yes. I mean, it, you you try not to mix uh, precision tool and gauge makers with uh, with production machinists because you know they have a they are trained. To be very careful, they're working at a, at a, you know, with a different, to a different level of precision than somebody on the production floor, and uh, and and so you know when you are, and so you you have a class of people who typically work to within ten thousandths of an inch, uh, and then another class who works within one thousandths of an inch, and then you get into precision tool and gauge making. You're talking about microns or you know, two ten thousandths of an inch, and then you know the uh, but this that, those kind of uh, that kind of hierarchy within a manufacturing plant they are pretty much uh, transparent. They're not transparent, but they're opaque. They, people don't know that. They, they don't see that. In uh, in you know the layperson doesn't understand that because they're not a, they haven't been a part of it. But that's. But even what you're talking about, you know, with those levels of tolerances, you know, when we talk about building construction today, you know, plus or minus a quarter of an inch isn't all that bad. Um, yeah, yes, I mean, that's why you wouldn't send a guy like me out to to do a job that it, where that type, kind of tolerance is, it, it, is required uh, because that would, that would drive me crazy and it would drive – the guy who hired me crazy because I'd be taking too much time to to make it perfect. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I mean that's uh, that's the way. That's pretty much what's uh, ingrained, what's driven into you and ingrained in you when you uh, when you are going through the different trades or the craft. The craft trades is um, you know the requirements of, of the job and uh, my my. My mindset is, you know, if something says uh, 1.0 inches, then it's 1.0 inches. It's not point, it's, it's not point eight seven five or something like that, you know. <laughs> I'm like, ah, eh, it's kind of close. 
Anyway, um, we're yeah. running. <laughs> you know, I'm great at putting a drawing together, but just don't put me in the shop. Oh, I, I was bad, actually bad. Bad, because uh, it's like ah, it's kind of close. You know, we can put a little putty there and paint over it, and no one will notice. Well, I was in the shop yesterday, and I was working on another uh, part of my uh, uh, ancient alien appearances, which is coming up the, the end of uh, February. So, and I was turning a shaft. Uh, it was actually a copper rod, and the, the uh, purchasing agent I wanted uh, five sixteenths of an inch, and the purchasing agent got three eighths of an inch. So I had to turn it down to five sixteenths, and 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 I was. Uh, very, very irritated with myself when I found that I was two thousands under, and then I thought, why are you irritated with yourself? It doesn't really matter what it does. TV. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to jump to one last site, um, which is Nazca, um, and talk a little bit about the lines. And Brian, I, I'm just going to say, you know, before we came on uh, the air, you had shared some images of me of places that you were planning on going on the tour, and one of the places was Nazca, and you shared this image of this giant trident. I think most people, when they think of Nazca, they think of the monkey, and they think of the spider, or the, you know, the, the runways, or whatever, you know, the straight lines that run all through the desert. You know, but you don't really see this trident-looking thing. What, what's going on with that? Well, that's that's one of the cool things is that I'm in uh, the little town of Paracas, which is about three hours from Nazca. And the trident, which is a 600-foot-tall uh, geoglyph, is about five miles away from me. Uh, you can only see it from the ocean. And um, it's part of the research I'm doing here uh, because Nazca, as well, Nazca is a very complex, much more complex a subject than most people give it credit uh, credit for. Um, the first people who lived in the Nazca area were the Paracas people, who were the, the ones I'm studying, and they're the you know they had elongated heads. <laughs> it's the simple way to put it. They had huge. These huge cone head like shaped heads, at least the uh, nobility, and it's believed that they were responsible for the making this huge trident as a navigational marker and also uh, making the animal figures at Nazca the lines being made later the lines are later than the animal images yeah that's the that's the latest uh thought. Yeah is that the animals were there first, made by the mysterious elongated skull Paracas culture, who then became amalgamated into the uh, the Nazca people who descended from the highlands of Peru. And uh, then uh, about a thousand years after that, <clears throat> uh, the Nazca lines were, were made. That's interesting. Um, yeah. You know, because I saw on... Well, I think it was on Ancient Aliens when they were just first came out, I don't know, somewhere, where um, Eric Von Donegan had talked about where one of the runways were, that they actually had to, like, cut off the top of the mountain to flatten it out to put it in. Yeah. Um, the more that I look at the landscape there, the more I'm uh, convinced that actually that's natural weathering that actually what happened was that the you know the fl these flat mesa like things it's almost like in uh, the southwest of of the US where you have so much erosion happening over millions of years that you have these you know these natural ish you know flat top um structures um yeah i uh yeah i'm i'm a lot more pragmatic in my approach to nazca <laughs> i i i don't think i don't think aliens were involved with that Puma Punku, on the other hand, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, uh, yeah, Sorry, I, I took a, a Incan art, well, art anthropology course in college. I have a minor sort of in art history, art history, ancient art, and I was so disappointed when I found out how those uh, glyphs were actually made, and they just kind of scraped away the dirt, and it created these differentiations in color. You know, it wasn't this deep, 
carving into the earth, this kind of thing. No, that's true. The thing is that we actually replicated that for for Ancient Aliens. Um, the episode that uh, one of the episodes I did that covered Nazca, you know, we went out and I dragged my foot across the ground and created a line, and then the then, then the police arrived. But aside from that, <laughs> and a small bribe later, um, but yeah, the lines aren't that um, are not deep. Um, they are straight. The animal figures are far more intriguing because of many for many different reasons. And the the so the candelabra, which is the trident, it's carved uh, 40 centimeters into incredibly hard sand. So it's a different structure um, altogether. Is there any association with that uh, glyph, you know, any myth tying it to, you know, uh, Inca sea god kind of stories? Well, that's great. That's a great question because um, there are tours that are are, um, are given every day from Paracas here out to see that. And the explanations are, A, that uh, pirates made it in, in order to... Um, uh, have a symbol to hide treasure, which sounds quite stupid. Um, and they then the just other, put a giant X. I mean, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> or a dollar symbol. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the other explanation is that it uh, that the early practice people had this cult, this cactus cult, uh, because of the um, hallucinogenic properties of the San Pedro cactus. But I also don't think that's true. The latest. Um, Theory, which Senior Juan of the museum, the director of the museum here, believes is he believes it's a navigational marker, and it actually is a representation of the Southern Cross in reverse. So he thinks what it is is the marker represents home, and that the ancient um, Paracas people traveled the Pacific, including going to Easter Island, for example, and uh, that, that that marker basically, you know. Told them that that they they and others had reached you know returned to home the home base area. So I'm studying, you know, wind currents and 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 water water currents and all that sort of thing for the next book I'm going to write. Is there any significance with the Southern Cross, you know, yeah. as a constellation? Yeah, actually the proportions are almost exactly the same. So if you go, you know, it's basically, if you draw, if you put the four points of the Southern Cross and then, uh, you know, connect them uh, and then add a few little features, you have the same proportions um, with this trident feature. So no sea god myths, huh? Uh no, but still, you know, the same, the same idea, a maritime marker. So I'm also going through... The oral traditions that I can that that speak of of the ancient seafaring uh, techniques, uh, what materials they would have used, um, you know, partially basing it on on Contiki um, and all of Thor Heyerdahl's work because he was <clears throat> he was to a great extent um, uh, I guess you could use the word trashed um, after he wrote Contiki because he became fascinated with Easter Island. And the stories that there were red-haired people that lived there. And the funny thing is that that's exactly what I'm finding in Paracas. We're finding uh, skulls here that have red hair. And so I'm trying to um, establish whatever it is that I can about this. You know, who who were these people? Is it possible that there, you know, was genetic input uh, from somewhere else um, on the planet here, aside from the... Uh, the native um, South American people who have genetically black hair. Interesting. Well, I'll be interested to find out how that turns out. Um, looking at the clock, Chris, any comments about the lines? I mean, obviously, you know, scraping up a bunch of dirt, not a whole lot of high precision, but the size and enormity of them, any comments about well, I think, yeah, I mean, I'm uh, actually looking forward to visiting them for the first time in August. Um, the the work that really uh, brought them to the public's attention, I think, was uh, Chariots of the Gods uh, by Eric von Daniken. And uh, 
and uh, I was fascinated by, you know, the uh, their existence and particularly the the narrative that uh, they were they could not have been made uh, unless you were uh, somewhere above the earth at you know ten thousand feet or whatever to be able to visually guide the people who are actually creating them but then it did seem to be a little magical and then uh later on the uh the opposition came out against the uh, uh chariots of the gods and and the construction of these was minimized um i still think that they are significant i obviously then they don't have the uh the, the same kind of uh importance uh, because it's not what you were, you were considered to be terraforming, like you like you find in in uh, at a Yontitambo or other places in Peru, but it's a, a little it's a superficial kind of reshaping, so to speak. And I agree with Brian. I don't think we can automatically, when we look at a natural feature, we we automatically uh, tend to. Um, see if it fits into the whole ancient alien agenda, which is not necessarily my agenda. I, I, I'm, I prefer to look at the evidence and describe the evidence, maybe pre- present some alternate views, but uh, I don't necessarily always, I, I don't necessarily land on the, the uh, alien intervention kind of hypothesis. But as far as the lines are concerned, I think they're a fascinating. I'm looking forward to seeing them. I, I doubt that I, you know, that my instruments would uh, actually have any any bearing on on the discussion, though. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, just real quick, because um, we're almost out of time. Brian, you had a new book come out, like. Two days ago? Yeah, it's a, a book that I co authored with David Hatcher Childress. It's about uh, the global phenomenon of the uh, elongated skulls. Um, so it's available through um, Adventures Unlimited Press, which is also where you can get Chris's books. And uh, it, it looks at um, all the cultures in the world who did what's called cranial deformation, which is changing the shape uh, of babies' skulls in order to make them, you know, the best or the simplest description is conehead-like. So that uh, sup- supposedly took place in Egypt, um, but also amongst the Maya, the Olmec, the island of Malta in Russia, uh, Iraq, Melanesia, and uh, the majority of the one of the skulls that have been found actually are here in Paracas, Peru. And I'm about 20 feet away from 30 of them. <laughs> so will people be able to see those on the tour too? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay, and again, where's when? Where's the tour? How can people get information? Or is that available yet? Uh, the tour is August 1st to 10th, with the four-day extension of Nazca and Paracas after that. Um, if people want to, they can um, – I'll, I'll give my information for it. Um, uh, they can go to my website, uh, www.hiddenincatours.com, and on the front page, there's information, um, be- the beginnings of information about how they can sign up for it. Cool. Um, and Chris, what have you? Are you working on any books now? I mean, because you know we had you on the last time talking about the uh, lost technologies of ancient Egypt. You got anything in the works? Um, you know, I uh, even after my first book was published, and my it was like thirteen years until my second book was published, <laughs> and so I could I would say that for that thirteen years span, I was working on my second book. So I guess I am. I, I do believe I, I do feel like I've got a couple more books in me. Uh, you know, I've always said though that I, you know, it's. I'm not in the business of writing books. I I I, I like to I, if I, unless I have something important to say. It's not my intention to just keep on writing books. And uh, 
but I think an, an update to the Giza power plant is going to be warranted in the uh, in the future. Maybe I don't know, five, ten years down the road. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and uh, South America is is really piquing my interest now too. And as things are a little difficult in Egypt, I mean, there's still a lot of research uh, in Egypt and uh, in other parts of the world that interests me. But, uh, you know, South America is right next door for me. So, you know, it's a natural, natural progression, I think, to start looking at some of those, uh, places and maybe a book about South America eventually. Uh, you know, right now I'm just so busy. I, I, I can't even think about starting a, a book project right now, but, uh, we'll see, you know, I mean, I'm close to retirement and, uh, Hopefully, when that day comes, I'll I'll have the uh, time and the energy to do that. Great. I mean, one of the things about South America is it seems like the sites are still accessible to people, and there's not you know fences and walls keeping you from going and looking and touching, which is wonderful. Right. Well, that's yeah. Sorry, that's that's very true, and that, you know I don't want to tell the public too much, but at Puma Punku, you you know we've had incredible access. Just because even the people who uh, run Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, they almost disregard Pumapunku. So for us, that's perfect. You know, we yeah. can we can stick you know squares on the stones and all sorts of things like that. It's great. Yeah, I spend uh, I spend about three or four hours just taking measurements of Pumapunku, and uh, yeah, the only. The only uh, problem that the guard had was that uh, I had I'd actually put my coat on one of the blocks and and some of my instruments. So, but other than that, he didn't he didn't mind me uh, taking measurements or using my square or straight edge or anything like that. But I, I found that I found that Puma Punku is really piquing a lot of people's interest. People are fascinated with that place. Mm-hmm. Well, there's and, the and, music. Oh, oh, and for good reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's the music, which means we have to go. So, guys, thank you, thank you, thank you. Great show. Excellent information. I just so appreciate you coming on and spending the time. And that tour. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. I am going to let you go, and I will talk to both of you soon. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. because of your time there and what you've looked into. And Chris is kind of the technical end, and I think those two aspects would blend into a really nice broad picture of what's going on down there. Well, I think Brian brings a lot to the table, and it's not just in the area of the cultural history, but also he's a, a craftsman himself. And so he doesn't really talk that much about that, but uh, he's he's uh, he knows about the crafting and uh, and he 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 understands uh, the concepts of uh, precision and the concepts of what could be machine made and what what can be made by hand. So uh, he adds a lot of value in the technical area too. Well, okay, everybody, pat yourselves on the back, but we're going right. to start our virtual tour now. <laughs> Okay, um, so let's start in Cusco. So, Brian, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of rely on you for some historical information. 
Um, what can you tell us about Cusco, history, mythology, anything? Well, the standard story is that um, the Inca originated around Lake Titicaca, which is where we find Tiwanaku, by, you know, for example. Um, and they left there about the year 900 AD uh, because of a number of factors, including there was a 50-year drought that existed uh, in that area of Lake Titicaca, and so uh, they basically ran out of food. And the population of the Tiwanaku area was supposedly uh, at least 250,000 people and could even have been a million, and now it's, you know, just a little village. Um, so that was devastating. And then uh, so, uh, some tribal people called the Wari basically chased them out. And um, so they headed north. And where they headed was the Sacred Valley, which is just outside of Cusco, and supposedly formed Cusco around the year 1200. Um, and so that's what all of the standard um, academic texts... Uh, ...from building to operating high-powered industrial lasers, including the position of project engineer and laser operations manager at Danville Metal Stamping, a Midwest aerospace manufacturer. He's now a senior manager at that company. So please welcome to Just Energy Radio, Brian Forrester and Christopher Dunn. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Fine, thanks. I'm doing great. Thank you, Rita. Hey, thanks for coming on the show. I think this is going to be really interesting because we're going to get this kind of blend of, you know, social and cultural and historical along with technical, and I think it's just going to make for a very interesting conversation and dynamic. But to start, um, I want to start with you, Chris. Um, the work you've done in the past has really been, and the focus of your last two books has been on surrounding the construction of statuary and temples in Egypt. What's drawing your attention to looking at what's going on in Peru? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, my uh, my studies have been mostly in Egypt. I've, I've traveled in Egypt nine times and done a lot of research there. Uh, I have, have two books, the, the Giza Power Plants, and my last book, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt. But... Um, I first went to Peru and Bolivia in 2005 with uh, David Hatcher Childress. And what I was, what I normally do when I go to an ancient, ancient sites is to look for, uh, look at the works that these ancient people did and, uh, to see, you know, essentially what, what level of technology they may have been using, uh, the uh, amount of difficulty in, in their, in their craftsmanship and and essentially uh, if there are any what I consider to be signatures of uh, advanced uh, machining or advanced uh, methods of manufacture the uh, I found it in Egypt I mean it's all over Egypt and everybody uh, most people recognize now that that the ancient Egyptians were highly advanced and there was a there there's information that was being discussed about Peru and Bolivia that seemed to indicate that they too were uh, also advanced. But before I could comment on that, I had to go there. And uh, so in 2005, I went, went through Peru, went to all the major sites, which we will be visiting in August. And they did some amazing things. I mean, it is a huge mystery uh, in Peru uh, and Bolivia. It, uh, the uh, level of te technique that that uh, they used was surprising to me. And as I, as we I went through Peru, um, I, I couldn't really relate what they had done with how the Egyptians were cutting stone, cutting and moving large pieces of stone. Their their uh, Constructions are simply mind-blowing in a way. When, uh, particularly when you look at the amount and the amount of stone that they had cut very precisely and fitted together, almost like a jigsaw puzzle, uh, and it, it, you stand in front of these uh, massive walls with hundred-ton pieces, 
and you, you scratch the head, you know, your head. It's sort of, you know, how, how did they cut these so precisely? How did they even lift them and put them into position? All these questions uh, come to mind. But, but, but the, uh, the true precision that we find in Egypt, I, I, I wasn't uh, really finding that much in, in Peru, uh, except for ultra flat surfaces, they did have some elements, particularly at Ayante Tambo, uh, where they have, uh, ultra flat surfaces. Also, you find it at the Coricancha in Cusco. So, uh, these, these sites, uh, had ultra flat surfaces. But and what I was thinking of doing is that we would kind of do like a little virtual tour, um, of some of the different sites. But before we do that, I understand that you guys are kind of working on doing a tour in South America, in Peru, and going to a number of these sites. Kind of, uh, do you want to talk about that for a second? What you're, what you're planning? Sure, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, we've um, figured out that uh, we're going to do this August first to August. Hello and welcome to Forbidden History Radio, where we explore humanity's hidden history, out-of-place artifacts, lost civilizations, and startling evidence that the truth is being suppressed. Well, today we're going to be talking about the uh, ancient technology of Peru. And to do that, we're going to be speaking with Brian Forrester and Christopher Dunn, um, both experts in different areas. Brian is an expert in Peruvian uh, structures and mythology and law, and Christopher is a machinist. But we're going to get a little more information from both of them here in a second. So let me introduce our guest today, and we're going to get started because we have a lot of material to cover. Uh, the study of the Inca culture led Brian Forrester to write a book, A Brief History of the Incas, and is also actively engaged in the native ship Shipio people from the central Amazon of Peru, promoting the sale of their traditional arts and crafts. In addition to his now four books, he has written articles for Graham Hancock. He is also associated with Lloyd Pye of the Star Child Product, who is analyzing the DNA of the elongated human skulls of the Peruvian Paracas culture on his behalf. Brian will be joining David Hatcher, Childress, and Hugh Newman uh, of Megalomitha, I cannot even say that word, on a tour of Peru and Bolivia, you know, and that's already come and gone. So I guess this bio is just a little bit old. So cancel that part, but I'm just going to throw this in. But Brian and Chris are going to be doing a tour of Peru in August, which we're going to talk a little bit about in the minute. Um, Christopher, on the other hand, has an extensive background as a master craftsman, starting as an apprentice at an engineering company in his hometown of Manchester, England. Recruited by an American aerospace company, he immigrated to the United States in 1969. Beginning as a skilled machinist and toolmaker, he has worked at almost every level of high-tech manufacturing. Tent. Um, and that will start in Cusco and make its way all the way to Pumapunku in Bolivia. And then after that, we're having a four-day extension. If people choose to, uh, to join with us, uh, much like we did with Megalithomania, where we went to Nazca and the Paracas area on the coast. Um, and... About 90% of the people on the Megalithomania tour did join us for that one, so um, 14 days in total. And it seems like in that 14 days, you're covering a lot of territory. It, it makes it sound like all of these sites are really not all that far apart from each other, that you can do so many in, in 14 days. Yeah, that's true. Of course, uh, you know, compared to places like the United States or Canada, which are monstrously huge countries. Peru is quite small, as is Bolivia. And fortunately for us, Pumapunku and Tiwanaku are only about half an hour from the Peruvian border. So it's, um, we do, you know, at least with megalithomania, we packed a lot in every day. 
And um, the major remark that people had at the end uh, was that they were so happy because we basically saw everything they had ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> and more. And more. <laughs> yeah, it was like it was nine o'clock in the morning until eight o'clock at night. It's, but it's just because I'm, you know, I'm I'm in, insanely interested in these places that, um, you know, I could go practically every day to them. Um, and that uh, became, it became very infectious with the people. Uh, we were also very fortunate to have on that trip. We had a couple of geologists and we had two engineers, and that's you know that's what I wanted because I'm not really an expert in anything, and um, I like to think of myself being humble enough that if I can't answer something, I'll find the expert, and that's where I'm very excited um, that Chris is coming because Chris is an expert and. Uh, as far you know, as far as I'm concerned, he is the you know number one in in the world in terms of my choice of who I would like to uh, visit these sites with. Cool. Oh shucks, <clears throat> Brian. <laughs> Go. I'm not worthy. <laughs> well, you know what? But I think you guys make a really great combination because Brian, I kind of see you 